Well, that doomsday clock they talk about was not designed in heaven. We have, at this point, around 800 bases in some 80 countries around the world. Uh, in fact, at the end of the Cold War, there were, uh, there were more bases, around 1,600. Um, so the number has divided in about half. Um, but the breadth of this collection of bases has actually doubled. There were uh, 1,600 bases in about 40 countries at the end of the Cold War, and today there are around 800 bases in around 80 countries. Um, so a growing number of countries are occupied, in fact, by U.S. bases. For example, there are almost 200 bases still in Germany, more than two decades after the end of the Cold War. There are more than 120 bases in Japan, nearly 100 in South Korea, 50 in Italy, and tens of bases in countries like Britain, Turkey, uh, and countries from Asia to Europe, Central America, and beyond. One of the growth areas, if you will, in the collection of US bases overseas is what are called lily pad bases, or more technically, cooperative security locations. Uh, these are bases that are unlike the giant city-sized bases, uh, sometimes called American towns, uh, that, that look like small, and some, in some cases not so small, American towns plopped down in foreign territory with tens of thousands of troops and family members, uh, fast food, schools, hospitals, housing, and beyond. Uh, the other end of the spectrum are these lily pad bases, far smaller, about 200, 300, 400 members of the military, sometimes military contractors. And these bases sometimes host drones or special operations forces, and they are popping up in parts of the world where, for a long time, the United States has had little or no military presence, places like Africa, really around the continent. Um, now, perhaps at as many as 60 locations, the U.S. has military facilities of one kind or another, um, as well as bases in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, Asia, uh, and as far off as Central America. One of the justifications for this huge collection of bases for decades has been that U.S. bases overseas spread democracy. And while this might have had some validity in the early days of the post-World War II era, in Germany, Italy, Japan. Uh, today, we find US bases in more than 30 countries that are led by undemocratic, often dictatorial regimes. So we have our bases de facto supporting and helping to prop up, in some cases, undemocratic regimes and helping to block the progress of pro-democracy movements. This is especially the case, of course, in, in the Persian Gulf, where there are U.S. bases in every Persian Gulf country except Yemen and Iran at this point, and actually the U.S. troops have returned to Yemen. Uh, all of those countries are undemocratic. Um, there are other undemocratic countries hosting U.S. bases in uh, Asia, in Africa, and uh, Honduras as well. Um, and this is, a, in my mind, should be a national scandal that we have bases that are supporting undemocratic, often violent, brutal regimes um, and actively blocking the spread of democracy, far from helping to spread it. U.S. bases overseas have been a, a major overlooked form of, of U.S. power in the post-World War II era. Uh, the U.S. military is able to maintain its troops in m most parts of the globe, and this uh, provides a, a, a form of influence and, and power um, that allows U.S. government officials to exert influence on, on, on other countries, um, and not just military influence, but political, diplomatic, economic influence to keep countries within a, a system largely defined by U.S. policymakers. Uh, there are, of course, also tremendous amounts of money that these bases generate in the form of contracts for, for military contractors who make in the tens of billions of dollars a year. So, even though, in, in many ways, maintaining so many bases overseas is, is very much an outdated Cold War and World War II era military, military strategy, uh, the money being made by military contractors sustains this system. It's become a, a, a system that, that uh, is self-sustaining um, and has taken on a life of its own, so that even when bases have no military function or very little military function, uh, they remain in place with very little thought of closing them. 
Despite the end of the Cold War, the United States has continued to maintain hundreds of bases in, in East Asia surrounding China, um, as well as hundreds of bases still in, in Western and increasingly in Central and Eastern Europe surrounding Russia. And in my mind, these are incredibly dangerous moves, especially the efforts to increase the number of bases, both surrounding China and increasingly close to Russian borders in, in Central and, and Eastern Europe. I think U.S. citizens should think for a moment how we would feel if Russia or China were to build even a single base any, anywhere near U.S. borders, in the Caribbean, for example, or in, in Mexico. I think there would very quickly be a, a hue and cry to uh, respond militarily, to build up our military defenses and military forces and military spending. So why we would expect anything different from Russia and China, I, I think, is, is perplexing. Um, it seems to me a, a very dangerous and potentially self-fulfilling strategy where uh, the rise of Chinese military power, for example, is the, given as the justification for building up U.S. military forces in East Asia. Uh, this is only encouraging China to further build up its military power and its military forces and what can be and is looking to be an escalating spiral of, of militarism. Uh, I think what is behind all this, of course, is a struggle for geopolitical, geoeconomic control. Uh, China and Russia have been rising powers in the last decade, decade and a half, two decades, and the United States is sought in various ways, although primarily in military ways, to maintain its global dominance. And the construction and maintenance of U.S. military bases near Chinese and Russian borders has been a major a facet of this strategy to try to maintain U.S. global dominance. China and Russia have been growing in power clearly in the past two decades and more. Uh, and as this power of, of both countries has, has risen, um, we've seen both countries seek to increase their influence on a, a global basis. Uh, Russia, it appears uh, that Putin has some desire to to return to the days of, of Soviet power, although it's important to point out that, that Russian military power in particular pales in comparison to that of the Soviet Union. It is nothing of the threat that, that some people portray it as. Uh, China, uh, while it, it has been uh, increasing the strength of its military uh, significantly in, in recent years, um, primarily has sought to increase its global influence through its economic strength, through strategic investments in places like, like Africa. Uh, and I think both countries, along with others in the, in the world, Brazil uh, and other rising economic powers among them, are, in my mind, just sick of following the orders of, of the United States, of of allowing the United States to be the, glo the global hegemon um, that calls all the shots and are looking for ways to uh, create more of a, a multipolar world in which uh, multiple uh, countries uh, set the, the rules of the political and economic game. So I think it's important to remember that, that U.S bases overseas are, are occupying foreign territory. I think most people in the United States have trouble uh, conceiving of living next to a, a foreign base, a base belonging to Russia or China, for example, or even France or, or Britain. Um, the president of Ecuador, Rafael Correa, actually was quite enlightening on, on this subject when he said, uh, as part of negotiations over the renewal of a a lease for U.S. base in, in Monta, Ecuador. He said, we'll renew the base uh, lease on, on one condition, that the United States allow Ecuador to build a base in Miami. And of course, this was a, a laugh line, but it, it reveals how inconceivable it is for most people in the United States to, to imagine uh, having a foreign base on, on, on our territory. Um, and, and this is the, the basic state of affairs for 80 countries around, around the world where U.S. troops and, and bases are, are occupying their territory. There are movements now um, growing in, in, in some cases. Uh, people are tired of their land being occupied. Um, and people in the United States and around the world can make common cause and support these movements. 
Um, I think we can also put pressure, again, U.S. citizens can put pressure on their members of Congress to do the due diligence and ask with every single base overseas, do we need this base? Because every unnecessary base overseas is, is robbing uh, money. It's, it's a, a theft, as President Eisenhower put it, uh, a theft from, from those who are hungry, from those who are poor, from those um, who are poorly housed and poorly clothed. Um, we need uh, to end this system of waste and uh, a system that has fundamentally undermined our security um, and, and reorient in the process our entire approach to foreign policy uh, from one based on military force uh, to one based around diplomacy and engagement. Uh, the, the answer is not to close all our bases and, and retreat to some isolationist America. Um, the answer is, while closing unnecessary bases, to increase our other forms of engagement, our diplomatic, political, economic, cultural engagement with other countries. Scientists agree, and they keep trying to warn us. The politicians hide the truth and try the best to scorn us. The masses are too busy with reality TV. Reality is fiction in a twist of iron.